Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. In this session, let's learn about benign prostatic hyperplasia. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, we will look into very briefly the anatomy and histology of prostate and then we will understand the uh, concepts of benign prostatic hyperplasia, the pathogenesis, the clinical features, the morphological aspects, diagnosis and treatment and a bit about complications of benign prostatic hyperplasia. So, prostate as you all know, it is a retroperitoneal organ which encircles the neck of the bladder and the urethra. What you need to understand is that it lacks a distinct capsule. So, this is a ejaculatory duct and that is the urethra. Okay? The weight of the the weight of the prostate is approximately 20 grams in the normal adult, which vary over time and in intensity. Okay. Anatomically, you have five lobes of prostate, which is anterior, posterior, median or middle lobe and two lateral lobes, right lateral as well as left lateral lobes. But whereas histologically, it is uh, characterized into different zones, which could be the peripheral zone, the central zone, transitional zone, and a very small periurethral zone, right? So, this is the transitional zone. Small part of a uh, prostate which surrounds the urethra forms a periurethral zone. Around this small area of periurethral zone is the transitional zone. And then in the central part of prostate, you have the central zone. And then the peripheral part is called as peripheral zone, right? This is a very thin anterior fibromuscular stroma. It's very important to know the different zones of prostate, particularly in the context of benign prostatic hyperplasia, because the benign prostatic hyperplasia is you know seen most often in the periurethral zone and the transitional zones, whereas the malignancies of prostate is found in the peripheral zones. Now let's briefly understand the histology of prostate. This form in the prostate is formed by the glands and stroma. Glands could be acini and the ducts. Each of these components is formed by bilayered epithelium, the outer cuboidal and inner columnar, which is a secretory uh, lining, whereas stroma is fibromuscular. You do find, you know, these concentric laminations, which are nothing but the corpora amylacea, right? So, fibromuscular stroma, and then you have acini and then you have ducts and each of these is lined by bilayered epithelium. Now, let us move on to benign prostatic hyperplasia. It is also referred to as nodular hyperplasia. It is a very common disorder which is characterized clinically by the enlargement of the prostate and urinary outflow tract obstruction and pathologically by the proliferation of glands and stroma. Okay? The definition is clinically by the enlargement of prostate and pathologically by the proliferation of glands and stroma. Coming to epidemiology of uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia, it is most frequent in Western Europe and the United States and least common in Asian population. Most common benign prostatic disease in men older than 50 years. Note that it is not a premalignant lesion and histologic evidence of benign prostatic hyperplasia is found in up to 90% of men by age 80. Moving on to etiopathogenesis of benign prostatic hyperplasia, there is a very important role of androgen dependent proliferation of glands and stroma. We need to know that it is androgen which is responsible for the development and proliferation of glands and stroma in the prostate. The most important androgen in the prostate is dihydrotestosterone. Okay? So, this is formed from testosterone through the action of 5 alpha reductase. Right? So, testosterone is converted into dihydrotestosterone. The conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone can happen either in the stromal cells of the prostate or in the periphery, particularly in the liver and skin. And the Enzyme required for this conversion is 5 alpha reductase. Note that in the liver, the 5 alpha reductase is type 1 5 alpha reductase, whereas in the stromal cell, it is type 2 5 alpha reductase. Now, testosterone, after its conversion into dihydrotestosterone, it binds to nuclear receptors. What binds? The dihydrotestosterone binds to nuclear receptors, and once it binds to receptor, that regulates the expression of various genes which aid in the growth and survival of epithelium and stroma. That's how normally the prostate develops over a period of time, right? So the most important factors responsible for the development or growth of epithelium and stroma includes fibroblast growth factor, 
as well as transforming growth factor beta. See, as age increases, it is said that the levels of 5-alpha direct, alpha direct A's increases and that is the reason why there is increased conversion into dihydrotestosterone which binds to nuclear androgen receptors, thereby regulating the expression of various genes which aid in the growth and survival of epithelium and stroma, right? And that's the reason for benign prostatic hyperplasia. It is increasing the levels of dihydrotestosterone in the prostate resulting in the formation, which is resulting in the development of prostatic hyperplasia. So, that's the pathogenesis of benign prostatic hyperplasia. How do these patients manifest? Basically, the clinical features are due to compression of the prostatic part of the urethra and then the consequent bladder out outlet obstruction. So, the most common features or clinical features include increased urinary frequency, could be nocturia, could be difficulty in starting and stopping the stream of urine, could be overflow, dribbling of urine, sometimes it could be painful maturation or dysuria and often because of collection of urine in the bladder, there is residual amount of urine which leads to increase the risk of developing bacterial infections of the bladder and also upstream bacterial infection of the kidney as well. So, what is the gross morphology? Consider this is the uh, section of normal prostate. So, that's the section of benign prostatic hyperplasia. As I told you, hyperplasia is seen predominantly in the transitional zones as well as periurethral zones, not in the central nor in the peripheral. Peripheral zones are the ones which are more prone for the development of carcinomas like this. Okay. So, this is benign prostatic hyperplasia. How do they look grossly? As I told you, they are periurethral, variably sized circumscribed nodules which can be solid or which can be cystic. Solid when the hyperplasia is predominantly stromal whereas cystic when the hyperplasia is predominantly glandular. You remember that the histology of prostate, right? It, it involves glands and stroma. If the stroma proliferates more than the glands, then the cut section will be solid. If the glandular proliferation is more, then the cut section is cystic, right? So, that's the microscopy of benign prostatic hyperplasia where you find lots of these proliferating glands. Remember, this is a fibromuscular stroma, lots of these proliferating glands and within these, you know, uh, hyperplastic glands, you find these Carpora amyliaceae. So, you should know that all these glands are lined by double layered epithelium which includes inner columnar and outer cuboidal and these are the beautiful Carpora amyliaceae. So, that's an illustration showing benign prostatic hyperplasia where you can easily make out that there is variably sized hyperplastic glands with papillary infoldings. Okay, that's the, the papillary infoldings represent hyperplastic epithelium, right? And these glands align by double layered epithelium as I mentioned earlier and you have fibromuscular stroma and that's the Carpora amyliaceae. So, what are the complications of benign prostatic hyperplasia? So, now, this is a normal, you know, uh, anatomy of uh, kidney, bladder and that's the prostate, the peri uh, urethral or uh, the gland which is encircling the urethra at the neck of the bladder, right? That's the prostate. So, when an individual has benign prostatic hyperplasia, the first thing which can happen is obstruction of urine, okay? The, I'm talking about the complication. The first complication you can expect is obstruction of urinary outflow, okay? And once there is obstruction, you can have retention of urine, right? And since you have retention of urine, there can be, you know, filling up of the bladder and there can be hydrourator and consequently, you can also have hydronephrosis. So, these are the various complications and then you can expect inflammation, infection, acute or chronic pyelonephritis and finally, as I told you, there can be hydrourator and hydronephrosis. All this is because of outflow obstruction. That's because of nodular hyperplasia of prostate, which is predominantly in the periurethral zones, right? So, that's the complications of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Now, how do you treat these patients? If, uh, if they are symptomatic and the symptoms are mild, all the patient is uh, advised is to take alpha adrenergic blockers or 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. So, we know that alpha adrenergic blockers decreases prostate smooth muscle tone and that's via inhibition of alpha-1 
adrenergic receptors whereas 5 alpha directase inhibitors physically shrink the prostate how we all know that the 5 alpha directase is the most important enzyme for the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone and we know what dht does right so there is decreased dht synthesis and thereby physically shrinkage of prostate that's the utility of 5 alpha directase inhibitors now if the symptoms are very uh, severe or moderate and the patient is not responsive to the medical line of treatment then of course the gold standard which was done earlier was the transurethral resection of prostate which was referred to as turp now you have newer modalities with low morbidity which includes high intensity focused ultrasound that's hifu could be laser therapy could be hyperthermia could be transurethral electrovaporization and radio frequency ablation so that's how the benign prostatic hyperplasia patients are treated particularly if the symptoms are moderate and severe and they are not responsive to treatment so that completes uh, you no know, benign prostatic hyperplasia we did understood we did understand the concepts of anatomy and histology and in detail about the benign prostatic hyperplasia thank you for watching